Where he belongs on the shelf is in the literature section. He belongs on the shelf next to Kafka and Garcia Marquez and some of the great figures of 20th century writing. Well, I was born here in, the, in this, uh, here, this apartment. And I still have a picture of myself having two years on this balcony here. Kapuscinski was born in 1932 in the little town of Pinsk on the eastern edges of what was then Poland, subsequently became the Soviet Union, is now the Belarus. A town which in those days was desperately poor, was virtually a third world town. And in the months and years that followed with the Nazi invasion, the Red Army counter invasion, a lot of the, the themes that would obsess him in later years were imprinted on him in ways that made it possible for him to relate to all sorts of poor people and also to all sorts of people in situations of desperate strife. Uh, that was my school in Pinsk. Now the proportions of the things are changing with the time. So I remember this is a very high, very large building. I see how small it is now. Uh, that we were playing here. I understand that you've been sentenced to death on a number of occasions. How do you face that psychologically? This is, I'm not talking about those problems, never. Never answer these questions. Next one, please. Is there any attraction to danger or is it simply an inconvenience? No, danger is a terrible thing. There is no attraction. I, I never saw the people who who are who don't feel fear. I was visiting the, the prisons of Savak after the revolution, and it was something really incredible. And we are interviewing one man who was working there for over 20 years. He was a painter of the walls, and that was his profession. He was professional painter of the walls in the Chamber of Torture. So each morning he was coming to the chamber of torture and painting the walls because they were so stained with blood. Now everything looks normal. This is the advantage which history gives to the murderers. What they are doing, they may kill people, a million of people, and nothing is left. No visible traces of what they did. The, the central metaphor for contemporary Poland is what happened in 1939, uh, when he was a child, but he, I think, has memories. Man and war, it shapes his psychology, his outlook and his patterns of thought. Once experienced, war never ends. He will always think in its images, imposing them on each new reality, a reality from which he is always partly estranged. Reality is time present, but he is possessed by time past, constantly returning to what he has lived through and how he survived it. His thinking is obsessively repeating, obsessively retrospective. I think most Poles understand that tragedy is unavoidable. The tragedy defines life, that people we love will die, that people we love will not love us, that this is ultimately unavoidable.
I think being nurtured in that sense and having too much tragedy in their lives, but also in recognizing that poetry is a defense against tragedy, that, uh, that living together is a defense against tragedy, that, that, that tragedy is the common enemy, but also because it is common, it brings us together. I think those are things that Poles are far more sensitized to than the pragmatic American. And the reason is, is very simple. We have lived much of our history in a uh, world where if we identify the problem, the presumption is we can solve it. Well, there are people who have lived in a world where identifying the problem is not enough. Uh, you can identify it all you want but you can't solve it. To Dnieper, and with Dnieper we pass the Kiev, and we go, go to the Black Sea. That's the Black Sea. Then we passed Istanbul, we passed Turkey. When I want to cheer myself up, I head for Feduzi Street, where Mr. Feduzi sells Persian carpets. Mr. Feduzi, who has passed all his life in the familiar intercourse of art and beauty, looks upon the surrounding reality as if it were a B-film in a cheap, unswept cinema. He believes that the nation will survive everything and that beauty is indestructible. You must remember, he tells me, as he unfolds another carpet. He knows I'm not going to buy it, but he would like me to enjoy the sight of it that what has made it possible for the Persians to remain themselves over two and a half millennia, what has made it possible for us to remain ourselves in spite of so many wars, invasions and occupations, is our spiritual, not our material strength, our poetry and not our technology. What have we given the world? We have given poetry, the miniature, and carpets. As you can see, these are all useless things from the productive viewpoint, but it is through such things that we have expressed our true selves. To us, a carpet, for example, is a vital necessity. You spread a carpet on a wretched parched desert, lie down on it, and feel you are lying in a green meadow. You see before you flowers, you see a garden, a pool, a fountain. Peacocks are sauntering among the shrubs. And carpets are things that last. A good carpet will retain its color for centuries. In this way, living in a bare monotonous desert, you seem to be living in an eternal garden from which neither color nor freshness ever fades then you can continue imagining the fragrance of the garden. You can listen to the murmur of the stream and the song of the birds, and you feel whole, you feel eminent. You are near paradise. You are a poet. Straight, 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 straight. That's New York here, that's America. So that's our route from Pinsk to New York. If you have enough will, we are stubborn, and we have enough imagination.